So, herzlich willkommen zurück. Wir sind jetzt beim äh, zweiten Programm über Deborah Schattmann. Das hat gestern angefangen um 20 Uhr, wo wir da schon vier Filme von ihr gesehen haben. Heute machen wir mit drei weiter. Ähm, gestern hatten wir hauptsächlich, oder sagen wir mal, einen thematischen Schwerpunkt auf ähm, Schweigen, Kontrolle und Überwachung. Kontrolle ist hier auch ziemlich ein wichtiges Thema, ähm, aber diesmal geht es auch etwas expliziter über amerikanische Kultur, Patriotismus und auch ähm, Macht und Eigentum. Also ihr werdet merken oder sie werden merken, dass es etwas schwierig ist, Deborah Stratman unter mit einem Begriff, also ihre Filme zusammenzufassen. Deswegen werden sie halt Artikel oder andere Vorstellungsrunden oder sie selbst, wenn sie halt sagt, okay, mein Film geht über, dann haben sie oft eine Aneinanderreihung von Wörtern, die versuchen irgendwie das alles zusammenzufassen. Ähm, Vielleicht eine andere Sache, die so als Kontrastprogramm hier auch wirken wird, ist, dass wir gestern sehr viele Nachtaufnahmen hatten und auch ähm, lange Einstellungen, was hier ähm, nicht so oft der Fall wird. Ähm, und wir konzentrieren uns eigentlich viel mehr auf Landschaften und inwieweit diese Landschaften immer ähm, auch Zeichen haben von ihrer Vergangenheit ähm, und auch inwieweit sie halt genauso Geschichten auch erzählen. Das ist für sie ähm, sehr wichtig und das werden wir auch besonders heute Abend bei der 18 Uhr Vorstellung mit The Illinois Parables sehen, wo es wirklich sie sehr genau darauf ähm, hingeht. Wir haben wie oft bei ihr auch keine richtige linearische Erzählungen. Also gestern, wo es am meisten linear war, war Hack Circuit. Ähm, sonst haben wir eigentlich so eine Art verschiedene Porträts, also Porträts nicht unbedingt mit Personen, sondern mit Ideen, mit Konzepten, die dann sozusagen auf eine Art und Weise aneinander gereiht werden und die Zusammenhänge werden halt durch den Schnitt dann gemacht und die ergeben dann ein Gesamtkonzept. Und das werden wir bei drei dieser Filme heute ähm, sehen und es ist, da fangen wir mit Untied ähm, an, das sind dann drei Minuten, das ist ein ganz kurzen, der viel mehr über zwischenmenschliche Beziehungen ähm, handeln wird und auch ein der mit Found Footage arbeitet, wo die tatsächlich wirklich aus anderen Filmen was genommen hat und nicht aus ihrer große Sammlung, von was sie schon mal gedreht hat. Und dann machen wir mit Energy Country weiter, das ist von 2003, das sind 15 Minuten. Und der ist thematisch gekoppelt mit Over the Land von ähm, 2009, der viel länger ist, der 52 Minuten ist. Die Deborah Stratman, die jetzt nicht da ist, aber danach natürlich kommen wird, ähm, zeigt eigentlich Energy Country ungern, das sage ich jetzt, wenn die nicht da ist, ähm, weil sie es sozusagen als Misserfolg ähm, oder also nicht unbedingt mit Publikum, sondern ist es für sie eigentlich ein bisschen unveräldeter Film oder etwas, womit sie nicht so ganz zufrieden ist, ähm, dass sozusagen dieser Film wird dann mit Over the Land nicht korrigiert, aber sagen wir mal Over the Land ähm, ermöglicht einem, der ist sozusagen wie sagt man das, der ist so weiter, also umbearbeitet und auch erweiterter ähm, Film von ähm, Energy Country, das sehr viel, das da auch wirklich diesen sehr großen Schwerpunkt ähm, auf Geld, Militarisierung, Macht, Religion und wie es ähm, sozusagen auch von verschiedenen amerikanischen Personen ähm, definiert wird. Genau, da bei ähm, Over the Land hat man wieder etwas, das wir in ähm, In Ode Not To Be hier gestern ähm, sehr stark präsent hatten. Und zwar diese, sagen wir mal, immer präsente Angst. Und gestern hatten wir sehr viel mit, ähm, mit Sicherheit und wie inwieweit Menschen sich eigentlich eingesperrt haben in ihre eigenen Häuser und so eine Art Panoptikon-Effekt entstanden ist. Und dann sehen wir eigentlich viel mehr, inwieweit Leute sich noch näher an äh, Waffenkultur kommen ähm, und auch wie sie sich dann auch innerhalb von, von dieser neuen politische, ähm, politische Phase dann auch neu definieren und wie der Patriotismus da auch ähm, behandeln wird. Das ist, genau, also man merkt, es ist etwas schwierig, das sehr schnell 
kurz zusammenzufassen, es sieht so aus, als wären extrem viele Themen, ist auch der Fall. Und jetzt gehen wir vielleicht direkt zu den Filmen. Wie gesagt, Deborah Stratman kommt dann zu uns und wir können eine kurze Diskussion machen. Leider haben wir nicht so viel Zeit, weil die nächste Forschung um 18 Uhr anfängt. Aber für ein paar Fragen von Ihrer Seite, dann haben wir natürlich Zeit. Bis dahin, schöne Vorführung. Thank you. Does your mic work? Yeah. Yes, my it time. does. Okay, nice that you're back, and I'm glad that we have a few people. Um, so, same as yesterday, as soon as you have a question, just give a sign, and we'll get you a mic, or I will get, we have enough, so I can come to you and get a mic, so, or Andy, Andreas can get a mic for you. Do we already have questions? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. You make such film to run. Right? <laughs> you want to try this one? No, it's easy. Let's go. Oh. Okay. So I was curious about Energy Land. Um, I don't know whether we can ask about it. Of course, yeah, okay. you can ask um, about I was curious because <laughs> it, it was announced as, as a, a failed film for you. So I was curious, when did you realize that this was a, a failure, like immediately after uh, finishing or only with like a year or uh, two afterwards? Um, I think immediately after finishing, it felt still necessary to me. It was a film that was reactionary, I think. I was really responding to certain circumstances that were happening at the time, just politically, economically. And so in that sense, it wasn't failed because it provided an outlet, you know, of certain frustrations. But I guess um, I like it when my films are a bit less direct or a bit less reactionary. And that's what I felt when I looked at it later, just sort of rubbed me the wrong way. Like, oh, I, um, I'm not saying it's not sometimes useful, if not necessary, to think really quickly and to react to your surroundings and produce something out of that. But for me personally, it has less, um, it opens up less than the other films because I think it's harder to read it multiple ways. I think some of the other work I make, the ones that to me are more successful are the ones that it's not so easy to only read it one way. So as far as how soon afterwards, I think it was pretty quickly within a year or two. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, but that doesn't, I still occasionally show it. and. Um, And I feel like the things that felt unresolved to me about that film are definitely what helped. Um, they weren't the reason I made Over the Land, but I think some kind of unfinished lines of questioning that came from Energy Country led to making Over the Land in an indirect way. So I feel like it was really useful in that regard. It's not a failure because it helped me get to another place that I felt... Um, Yeah, spoke more closely to how I was thinking. Does that help? It, yeah, because it struck me as surprisingly obvious in, in maybe ways with the quotes, with the poison water. So I was curious then, um, how did you manage to get um, over the land to not be the failure? How did you go for from energy country? Was it uh, a bit of a distance because you had the immediate reaction with energy country and then you could take some time? For over the land or? I think that's partly it. Um, I think by the time I was working on Or the Land, um, the question I was posing for myself had more to do with um, what do we lose in the name of freedom? Um, and, and the openness of that question and also because it allowed me to ask a series of pretty different populations Ha uh, American populations, um, how they define freedom for those for themselves. Um, it let the qu question be more open, I guess. And also, the film is, while it certainly is about expenditure and connections between um, kind of energy empire, oil extraction, the use of um, just the consumption of of 
both land and um, minerals and um, rights, I guess, is is in both films. Um, maybe the way it comes to the surface in the second one is more ambiguous. So it didn't, it wasn't a direct line from energy country to or the land. I think because of the nature of the shooting, like I took a much longer time to develop the ideas in or the land and, um, uh, yeah, what let it not be a failure? I don't know. It's hard to say exactly. I think just that I gave myself, I slowed down and it allowed me to, to sort of think about how to frame the questions in a more complicated way or, or a more ambiguous way that um, is more interesting to me. I know when I'm a viewer, I like when things feel less didactic and energy country feels, when I watch it now, like it's just so totally didactic to me that that's why I, I'm sort of like, Bleh. but some people like that. So there's definitely been people who defend that film and feel like I'm wrong, but I don't know. To me, the strategy is too direct. So, yeah. <laughs> um, in over the country, um, the editing and the sound and the gun range scenes, uh, in my opinion, are very um, concretely, ironically commenting on what is what is shown. So, I'd like to know um, what did you tell the people at those gun ranges? What, what kind of film you were going to make, what was the what the purpose of what you were shooting um, was. I mean, because obviously you um, you distance yourself from it. You know, it's funny that I feel like to some degree this film more than a lot of others I've made functions as a mirror back at the viewer in terms of because when when you bring up irony um some people do read it very ironically or very critically others completely not so um i totally see how irony can be with seen within that progression of shots but i also think um to some of the people who are there or people who are sympathetic to second amendment rights which is the right to bear arms or, you know, in these guys' case, the right to have a machine gun. Um, they didn't feel, or I didn't talk to all of them, obviously, but those who I did didn't feel misrepresented by it. Um, so the question or the thing I told them when people asked what I was doing is I was very, what I just said before, I just said I'm interested in how people... Um, define freedom or how do you what's the most essential way you define freedom for yourself and so in the case of the machine gun festival people it meant one thing in the case of the people who love the giant rvs it meant something else in the case of the french indian war reenactors or the people at the football game it I mean they all felt quite strongly about what freedom was to them um so it didn't there wasn't a kind of critique implied in, in my asking, you know, they were just, I mean, that guy, I think when on the soundtrack who says, Oh, everybody should come here and see this. It's what we're fighting for to own it, to own this kind of expenditure of, of just destruction. I, you know, he, he obviously is feels strongly about that. And many people did. I think it's another question entirely, whether the form of film I'm making would be some would be something they're like on board with, you know, because the structure is quite, uh, you know, extreme. I guess it's not a traditional documentary. I think people have more resistance to the form than they do to the um, the individual sequences or the or the sections where I sort of would pose that question to someone. I mean, one of the central. Um, how to say, um, I guess, sort of oxymoronic um, central ideas to me was that it seemed like Americans were really defining freedom in terms of ownership the more I thought about it. And so if you define freedom in terms of ownership or kind of manifest destiny and what you can 
what's yours, then it has to be how do you defend what's yours, and then the buildup of military infrastructure around that is part and parcel of how we define what freedom is. I, I felt like that was really central to what I kept finding when I was asking this question. I mean, I'm also, of course, biased to my own experiences and to some degree, you know, we all sort of find what we're already looking for, you know? Um, and and certainly one could make a million different films about freedom. They wouldn't all have to be something so materialistic or um, connected to um, these sort of mm, ratcheting up cycles of um, militarism or the sort of theater of war, but that was you know, I guess just where I was finding um, what the wall I was coming up against. Because to me, freedom is something much more metaphysical, c totally not tied to ownership and not tied to thingship, more tied to just your ego, letting your ego be subsumed by something much bigger. But um, I felt like in the myth that has been built up, this kind of iconic idea of what America is, the sort of nationalist sentiment about freedom, that's what seemed inextricably tied to, to, to ownership to me. I couldn't pull them apart anymore. Um, picking right up uh, the, on the word ownership, my, ma my question was actually much more of a practical nature from a filmmaking point of view, because as you might know, um, quite recently a new um, uh, copyright law has been introduced in Europe, which basically makes like filming street scenes, filming people on the street without asking their permission, uh, impossible. So um, I was I was wondering if all the people who have filmed like in the gun range scenes and other scenes where like many people are seen were aware that they were filmed and if they were aware what the purpose of filming them was that was that was actually the question because right after after screening a film I find it hard to you know like opening a philosophical discourse because the film is still like working and it's too early sorry to <laughs> i'm like i should pull back be more simple um well i was quite obvious with the camera because i was shooting with an eton which is a quite large 16 millimeter camera with a magazine and and i had at that time um a dat audio recorder so it was not discreet at all it was very obvious that i had a camera and um It was actually, you know, it depended on the circumstance. Some circumstances, people were very curious what I was doing. Um, there was a couple, but not very many occasions when um, people would um, decline wanting to be filmed. But for the most part, um, like what I said, I would just say, oh, I'm, I'm interested in this question of freedom and how Americans define it for themselves or what your iconic idea of freedom is. And... I'd see like, okay, yeah, have at it. I mean, I think, to be frank, I think being a woman behind a camera opens up possibilities much more than when you're a man behind a camera because you're not seen as a professional. And to me, <laughs> I totally use this to my advantage all the time. I think I'm not being facetious. I think it's absolutely the case that um, when people take you less seriously, they tend to let you film. They're more open to you filming situations that if I had been a man with that size of camera, I wouldn't be surprised if, if people would say no a lot more. Um, so I think that's part of it. I think I'm also a very open, kind of congenial person. I mean, I think part of it's just personal dynamic with who you're shooting. But obviously in the scenes where one sees a lot of people, I couldn't ask every person, hey, is it okay if I'm here? So I would ask, you know, the Border Patrol headquarters or, uh, I don't know, when there was that check with the sheriff's department buggies and um, they were loading them on the back of the trucks. You know, I just stopped my, I just saw them. I passed them on the road and I stopped and I said, I asked if I could film them and they're, they're like, okay. So I think, um, yeah, I don't know what entirely to chalk it up to. I think it's a mix of all those things, you know being earnestly curious and people sensing that, being a woman behind the camera cinematographer and uh, asking a question that people feel like doesn't shut down their potential answer to it. 
it's sort of a mix. Yeah. How do you work actually with persons? Because when when we look at your film, we have, or at least my sense of it, is that we have types of person trying to to show an idea that you are editing so that we are the either understanding as an ironic or maybe for the Second Amendment, but I have the feeling that all these person that we see all these characters do not really have a history or past. Mm -hmm. But you but you in yeah, in the moment where you're actually asking them or telling them what you're doing, you still talk to them, but we don't see anything of that dialogue and not a lot. And language when when it is used is like one or two sentences. Mm -hmm. So so how how would you say that you're working with them and how, how much are you actually editing out or or am I getting the wrong feeling about that or I think I mean I'm editing out very little visually but I'm editing out a lot sonically so I very often will have quite a bit of audio recordings with people because in some films I do use a lot of dialogue or a lot of conversation this one not so much um so it often, yeah, is the soundscape that I, mm -hmm. that I really edit down. But when I'm shooting on film, at least, this is less the case with video, I'm very economic. I mean, I really have a pretty small, you know, ratio. Not magazine, just, you know, the ratio of what I shoot yeah. to what I use is maybe two to one. I mean, it's not 30 to one or mm. 200 to one or what often... So I, I'm usually in a place a bit longer, not always, but I'm, it's quite considered um, and maybe pre-edited to a large degree when I'm shooting with film and I'll just go for some essential shots. But um, yeah, you're right. The characters, there's no, it's not the characters that are being developed in the film. It's the ideas. So it's an argument. It's more of, that's why it's more of an essay film, I think. It's not about... Uh, let's follow this one character, but um, let's follow this one thread of thinking. Even if you you're still putting the pieces together yourself as the as the viewer, but yeah. No, could you um, then? I have it's not really a question, but more about these two scenes actually, which are. To, yeah, to, to my feeling at first, they that are longer, the one was uh, William Rankin, the lieutenant, and then this first reenactment of the historical battle, and what their connection to freedom might be, or, or how, I mean, you, you, you do give them a lot of filmic time in this uh, in this work, and so especially the re reenactment, it's because it's so at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, could you comment a bit on that? Yeah. Um, okay, I'll start with the Rankin story, which is this story of the pilot, William Rankin, who gets ejected from his fighter jet at 48,000 feet and has this ordeal where he's trapped in the storm clouds for 45 minutes. And so I was, I found that's the first. I mean, I didn't have this film in mind, but I knew that story and I knew I wanted to use it long before I started the film. It came out of another project I had been working on about, that's not a film, it was about um, sort of telecommunication and power infrastructure in the US. And I had built a radio tower and I was researching um, instances when the power grid of the US goes down. And when I was researching, I came across Rankin's story. And I loved that he was able to, I mean, he gets kind of spit out by his jet so he doesn't choose this kind of freedom but he is in a way temporarily absolved of gravity which is sort of the ultimate sort of control structure you can't normally exit and just that the story is so visceral and so dynamic very melodramatic I liked thinking about that as a central axis of the film like a I mean, it's, he's not just falling down, but I still think of it as vertically because he's up there getting tumbled. So I knew I wanted to use it because he's, you know, sort of freed of a system, not by choice, but 
I was thinking of it more, yeah, allegorically, I guess. Yeah. Um, but also I liked the connection between his circumstance and the military industrial complex, which is very embedded in the film. Because all, many, not all, but many of the episodes, if I call them that, are, are really um, riffing on the idea of the theater of war or the staging or the ritualizing of a kind of, you know, space where there might be heroes and winners. Um, and so f the French Indian War reenactments kind of fit into that. But so equally to me do the football and players and um, and the, just the Morton Thiokol rockets or the, the giant oil drum. So it's a theme that keeps cycling back. And um, why, I don't know. I mean, the, the French Indian War reenactors, that scene was actually originally shot thinking of the Illinois parables. Oh. Yeah, and then I, later I realized, oh no, wait, it fits better in this film. Um, and the Illinois Parables was a later film. Yeah, so I was yeah. thinking, okay, it was like nearly no, seven years later. No, I'm often shooting material and I don't even know exactly yet what it will be for, but I see w I'm someone who really makes their film and as I edit more than anything else. And so sometimes something I thought would be for one project ends up being better in another. another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've also started getting really interested in enactment and reenactment, and we talked about that a bit yesterday, just how that as a mode of memorialization is pretty interesting to me. Um, so I liked that they were actors, but not uh, for me. They were doing it for themselves. Um, yeah, this kind of stagings, different kinds of stagings are, I don't know, I, c I think it's like a, um, a charging of a temporal experience, right? Because when you ritualize it or when it's something that can happen over and again, it sort of takes on, yeah. A dimension or another yeah. signification in a way. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I had the same kind of question about um, <coughs> the firefighters and the big antenna at the end, what's the uh, connection with freedom? And second, you know, the big, the big antenna. antenna. Ah, the, the end, dish. At the end, yeah, the, the dish, dish yes, sorry. Yeah. Because it made me think of Socorro, um, you know, there where they have this SETI program. Yeah, it's it's part of the VLA, the Very Large Array right, in New Mexico. Yeah. More or less the same thing. And uh, so it, I have an, uh, an answer for that for myself, but I'd like to have yours. And second of all, I came here totally by chance. Never heard about you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Didn't know what Thank I was going to see. Yeah, on a sunny day. Thank you. Buddy. Didn't know what I was going to see. But one thing that really struck me when I saw that movie, and I would like to know if it's uh, for you an inspiration, I've thought of Robert Kramer, Route 1 USA. Have you ever seen it? Yeah, but it's been a long time. A very long time. Well... I have made a connection. I don't know if it. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I I hadn't ever consciously thought of that film, but um, I admire the way politics get woven into his um, his rambling. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 it's a movie. Where, I don't know if everyone knows it, but it's a movie where doing the <coughs> Route 1 USA from Maine to uh, Florida, I guess, and it t talks about uh, American freedom also. Yeah. yeah. Um, so thank you for coming, <laughs> first of all, uh, taking a chance. And um, I would say to the uh, to the antenna shot, what was the other shot that you mentioned? The firefighters. Ah, the firefighters. You, you know, the two yeah. firefighters? Yes. Um, yeah. So for me, the firefighters um, definitely f fell into um, when I would ask myself, okay, what to me has been um, has been sold as an iconic Americanness. I thought of 9/11, and I thought of the firefighters, and I thought of the sort of patriotic, you know. Um, 
you know, heroic stature. I mean, these guys were practicing and they were a bit bumbling. So, and in fact, it turned out one of the times they didn't even have water in their fire truck. So I had to wait. I was waiting there while the fire got smaller and smaller and they came and then they got more water and then they practiced. So, um, so, so I love that they're also kind of practicing at the role. I mean, you know, whether or not the audience picks up on that, but there's something about their awkwardness that I find that I really love. Um, so that's why they're in there for me. And the VLA antenna is because when I think about um, the sort of ever broadening need for defense, if one defines freedom in terms of ownership, then I think about Star Wars. I think about space. I don't think about ownership just in terms of continental space, you know, the earth, but I think about literally, you know, okay, what are we going to mine next, the moon, or, you know, it's going to be, and also just all of the surveillance programs that are very, you know, space-based. So it was my nod, I guess, at um, a net that's even not confined by the planet, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. I, oh, okay. I mm. next question. Okay. This will be the last one, I think, okay. so that we can all have like yeah. five minutes break. Okay. <laughs> the next screening starts. Yeah. Is it on? It'll, it's, yeah. It'll be on now. Yeah, so I'm still recovering from all the land, but I generally have a feeling that so you take away all the characters uh, deliberately, so you, you only show the landscapes, but all the landscapes seem so artificial because they are all connected to human beings. So well, I don't take away the figures. I mean, when I, it's not like the figures were there and then I removed them. And I do, I actually... I sort of disagree. I mean, we see a large number of people in the landscapes. It's it's not only empty landscapes. So but are, I don't mean to c cut you off, but... Uh, so there are a group of people, but uh, there's no uh, the traditional way of a main character and in other films. So I see, feel like you just tr try to put some hints of human beings have been here, but not really in here. And all the conversations are convicted by audio instead of video. So you, so for example, for the uh, pilot, you only show the sky in instead of the man. Yeah, that's true, for sure. I mean, I actually, I do have films that I have used people speaking on camera, like talking heads, where you see them and you hear them talking. But it's fairly rare that I do that. I think, to me, I'm more interested in letting the sound and image do different work and the kind of, um, I don't know, that it opens up more space for me in the film. I feel like sometimes if I'm seeing a figure talking and also hearing them talking, to me, that's sort of, it's wasted space. I want to if I can hear them saying and they say everything I need to know, then to open up the image to do different work is more interesting to me. So it's not that I'm not interested in what they have to say. I just don't want to be redundant. Um, but I know that, you know, that's frustrating to some. Or people want to see, well, who is it that's talking? So they can have more of a sense of where or how to judge them from, which I get that. Um, I personally think that within people's idioms and how they speak, we actually sometimes can learn a lot about them. But obviously, that's different depending on if someone's a, a Native American English speaker, you might have a different take than if you're a Scottish English speaker and a different take than if you're a German speaker who doesn't speak English as your first language. So I also understand that those layers of feeling like you get a sense of a character's background have a lot to do with how sensitive you are to the language. But Yeah, I'm just curious about this uh, way because it's a, for the first time for me to see your way of language and it's 
kind of very interesting and I feel like the messages are a lot to process and they're yeah so anyway interesting yeah and uh, the a short question is that in the end so did you put the making of the film on purpose because I feel like it's kind of a very, very interesting contrast because uh, between you behind the camera with the very feminine voice and the patriarchy man in front of the camera and it's kind of lightened the tense feeling after the film yeah, I definitely put that there on purpose. I love that they ask, um, are you a director? <laughs> Although some people hear it as, are you an American? Which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, which, but either is probably an appropriate question, actually. And um, I think, to me, it was important because almost everyone I engaged with on the camera had a sense of humor, had a sense of openness about me being there. And in a way, I feel like, seeing those guys who who directed and ran the Viet Cong um, reenactment track where you shoot your machine gun, it wasn't, it was an open relationship that we had. It was a friendly one and it was one that we were in open dialogue with one another and I really liked those guys. So I wanted, I don't know, it was my way to just show a little bit of, um, I'm not, contemptuous of my subjects. I mean, I, I have a lot of empathy for even everyone at the Machine Gun Festival. I think I have a lot of empathy for our human need for that kind of catharsis or, you know, that comes from that level of violence in a way. It's, it's, it's not that I, I would choose it myself necessarily, but I understand it's a sort of a necessary um, kind of expenditure that is meaningful to people to be around that kind of destruction and yeah anyway we should we okay, should wrap we up because i need know to and then <laughs> we'll have like 10 minutes break and then we can all thank you meet again. Uh, for hanging out <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes we yeah. have two films by Devo stratman um the illinois parables and these blazing stars yes so a short that's like 15 minutes and then one that's about an hour Stay with us. If you're feeling, yeah, you want, yeah, 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 please. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say. <laughs> same director, but not the same topic. <laughs> Thanks, guys.